Hello, my dear friends, and today we will read the story of Kurt Weidemann, telling us about his first battle in the Demyansk Cauldron and the fact that they built a whole house underground. You will agree that this is a crazy story. I think it is worth focusing on his personality. Kurt Weidemann is a German typographer, graphic designer, and writer. He was born on December 15, 1922, in Poland. After World War II and five years of his captivity in the Soviet Union, he studied as a typesetter in Lübeck and later graduated from the State Academy of Fine Arts in Stuttgart. He worked as head of the Department of Information and Graphics Practice at the same institution since 1962. As early as 1957, Kurt Weidemann became an independent graphic designer. He was recognized, first of all, for creating the logos of many famous brands the way we know them. Kurt Weidemann has designed brand fonts for Porsche, Mercedes-Benz, Zeus, Merck AG, and Deutsche Bahn AG. Moreover, he has designed many book covers for well-known German publishers. He was an extraordinary and charismatic personality, there is no doubt about it. Well now, let's turn to his story. Our platoon held a 150-meter-long defensive line along the Polomet River, right along the river's crest. After the successful attack on Staraya Rusa in August, we were moved here, and we practically came to a standstill. I was promised a leave for the August battles, but I got a leave after ten years. <laughs> and as soon as the real winter began, we felt that everything was at a standstill. This must be our ultimate destination. Moscow was supposed to fall, and we have to be the ones waiting for it. We are only secondary. Small by small, we dug deep trenches and began to prepare for Christmas. There was a village about a half a kilometer away. I can't recall the name of it now. It was the section of another regiment but they weren't doing well in it either. The Russians bombarded it from time to time, and being on duty there was like a punishment. Gradually, at night, we dismantled the houses to strengthen the dugouts with logs, and eventually it happened that we dragged almost the whole house there and built it deep into the ground. Unfortunately, it was without a stove. We built the stove by ourselves using two barrels. We took one smaller one of our own, and the second one was found in the village and we inserted one into the other, and the space between them was filled with earth. We also found a nice painted oak door in the village and used it. There were two squads fit in our underground house, and on the other side of the trench we dug another dugout, and there were the command and the others. The headquarters and all the big officers stayed in Zabolotia, and never appeared to us. The frosts didn't disturb us much, as we spent all our time in our ground house. We had a few Russian Valenki wearing, which we were on guard duty. Things were bearable, then a word got around that the situation near Moscow wasn't so good and that we would have to stay there until spring. We had no idea of the real state of affairs. In general, it was comparatively quiet. The Russians occasionally shelled the neighbors and the village. We didn't suffer. However, it was decided to strengthen the machine gun positions and prepare reserve ones. It was after Christmas, in early January, that the Russian artillery seriously attacked us for the first time. It was not that the shells hit the targets, but they were firing for a long time and methodically at the neutral zone, making our weak defensive fortification a mess. We hid in our underground house anyway. Then their attack was launched. There was a forest 700 meters opposite us, on the other side of the river, and they started coming from there. Our machine guns fired at once, and the little figures began to fall there but it was like a nightmare. More and more figures came out of the forest, and it seemed to us that we would run out of ammunition, but we wouldn't finish the figures. Then suddenly something happened that we did not expect, neither they nor we. It started snowing so hard that the field in front of the trench became a mist. We were unable to see anything for a hundred meters. Simultaneously to our left, there was such rifle fire that we sang hallelujah to our neighbors. Then silhouettes began to appear in the mist and we began to shoot at them again. But it was only a short distance to reach us. All of a sudden, our center machine gun went silent, and the left machine gun stopped almost at once after it, and we realized that it was probably the end of us. In order to retreat deep into the defense, it was necessary to return to the midpoint of the trench, where there was a gap and where the second squad was defending, and where now, I guess, the Russians were. We ran, as many of us as remained, into the dugout and closed the door. There was no other choice to save our lives. We were inside and realized that there was an enemy outside in our trenches, and we were sort of trapped. Thank God they never saw us running away. First, they tried to break down the door with their shoulders, 
but it was a really solid door, and they didn't have time for that in the heat of battle. A few random bullets pierced through the door with no one getting hit, and we had a chance to look outside. It was a gruesome picture for us from the outside. The Russians, there were a lot of them, crowded into our section of the trench right by our door. I guess the other section was under fire, and they were sitting like rabbits in a warren. There was five of us inside, without automatic weapons. We didn't know what happened to the others from our section. I forced myself over and looked through the bullet hole to the outside. I never saw them so closely before. I was morally ready to surrender, but not in front of my comrades. And I was scared of the very moment when you, weaponless standing as in the Middle Ages at the mercy of the conqueror, and cynically walk around. But so far we are all hoping for God only knows what. Then their hooray sounded, and most of the Russians jumped out of the trench and rushed deep into our defenses. They ran a few dozen of meters and got into the flank fire of the machine gun of the first squad, which ran away from the positions but did not get to the second line of trenches and dug in the middle of the field in pure snow. Thank God the Russians didn't notice them due to the snowfall. We found out about it later, but at that moment we were in this house thinking how to survive. They later justified themselves that they thought that everything was lost and they were left alone, so they ran. Suddenly, our artillery started to fire on the trench. They probably decided that there was no one alive here anymore. A shell burst right above us, and the shrapnel shattered our door in two. And almost at the same moment, two Russian soldiers rushed in, fleeing the shelling. They simply fell in, as if someone had thrown them in, and they remained lying there with their hands over their heads. The third one ran in by himself. Probably he looked the most dangerous to us, and we did not hesitate to shoot him, each. The first two men pressed even more firmly to the ground. Then they carefully look up at us and stretch their arms out, as if to raise them up. We wait tensely too, but it seems there was no one in our trench anymore. The snowfall, the shelling, and the Russian attack have ended. The trench is full of dead men. All our second squad died with no exception. There was only one Russian alive, who probably went to the second attack. But his legs were broken and he crawled back into the trench. And then he was covered with a corpse from above, which protected him from shrapnel. We threw him with the dead men over the trench parapet, down the slope. The field in front of us was covered with dead and wounded. Our captain, the company commander, had to come see our two prisoners. One of them looked so much like a German that I even asked him in German, but he gave no answer. The only man in the platoon who knew Russian was in the second squad and was killed. The captain led the Russians out of the dugout and showed them the wounded man we had tossed under the parapet. He tried to explain to them that they were free to go but they must take that one too, and they were also allowed to gather the wounded from the field until tomorrow. During the night, we heard the Reds carrying out their wounded. They did not take the dead ones out. When we asked our lieutenant what kind of benevolence the captain had shown, for the Russians would not be so eager to do so. He said that a wounded soldier causes much more trouble than a dead one, and secondly, if we were big-hearted, they would be more ready to surrender. Afterwards, we used that tactic frequently. I used the Russian's rifle for a long time later, and when we left the position, I put it in our underground house, so that I wouldn't have to drag something unnecessary. It happened that the Russians almost wiped out a neighboring division and pushed deep into our rear. We survived, the attack hit us in passing. Even though we were almost at the junction, we were also surrounded. That is all for today. Kurt Weidemann had a long and eventful life. He died in 2011 at the age of 89. It seems to me that even his lifetime in the war was something of an exceptional, remarkable story. If you enjoyed it, please give it a like and support the channel with a subscription. Goodbye, everyone. Until new meetings.